Hi, I'm Carlton Coffrin. In this video, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the PowerGridLib Optimal PowerFlow Benchmarks. This video has two primary goals. First, to tell you what these Optimal PowerFlow Benchmarks are and where they've come from. And secondly, to show you how to access these datasets and get the most out of the data that's been made available. Before I can get into the details of the Optimal PowerFlow Benchmarks, it's important to understand that these benchmarks are part of a broader IEEE PES task force activity called PowerGridLib. PowerGridLib is a collection of repositories for specific optimization problems in the power research community, and in this particular case we're looking at the Optimal PowerFlow problem, but that's just one of many possible problems that could be hosted as part of this initiative. The PowerGrid lib makes specific requirements of all the types of repositories that it hosts. Those requirements include that there must be a specific problem specification which is being optimized. So these benchmarks are curated for a very specific problem specification. And this is uh, quite different than traditional test cases like the RTS 96 test case, which are really designed to be foundations which then you can build upon. The next requirement is that all the datasets have to be provided in a standard data format so that users only have to understand how to read one kind of data and then they can access all the different benchmarks. And last but not least, the data should be provided in open in a collaborative way and so all of the datasets are released under a Creative Commons license. Now that we understand that broader context, we can jump into the Optimal Power Flow Benchmarks Overview and uh, this URL indicates where you can find them online. And it's important to note that what I'm going to be showing you today is the initial release of this benchmark library, which is version 17 for the year 2017. It may change drastically in the future, so uh, it's important to keep track of what the latest uh, documentation is. But all of the documentation is contained as part of the repository, so if you just read that in detail, you'll be up to date with whatever the current version is. So let's look at the first part, uh, which is what problem specification uh, does this repository, um, is it designed for? And it's for this particular optimal power flow problem that the repository was designed to. Now, I don't really have time to go into all the details of this notation and whatever every uh, part of this model is, but if you want uh, additional details, you can go to this particular paper and it's all derived uh, in great detail. I'll just give a very, intuitive and brief overview of what is in this model. You have quadratic fuel costs on the active power of the generators. You have uh, box-like constraints on the, what the generators can output in active and reactive power. You have uh, bus shunts in Kirchhoff's current law. You have transformers in the branch model, and you also have line charging in the branch model. There are two different types of, therm of constraints on the line, both a thermal limit and an angle limit. Now, there are many alternate formulations out there for the optimal power flow problem, but basically due to historical reasons, this is the one that we've adopted for this benchmark library. Now, for a data format, it's no surprise that map power has become uh, the research standard for doing AC modeling, optimization, and simulation. So we have adopted the map power format as the standard data format for these particular files. And they come in a textual format with ha which has a matrix form that you're seeing on the right here. So that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's familiar with working with power network data sets. Now, as a base, this particular benchmark library includes 36 different networks that come from various sources, and they range from as few as three buses to as many as 13,000 buses. This pie chart is indicating the relative um, quantity of different test cases and where they come, and I'll just go through each of these categories briefly. The IEEE test cases include things like the RTS networks and networks that come from other seminal papers. The UW cases are from what's often called the Power System Test Case Archive at the University of Washington. PSERC includes a recent Illinois 200 test case and a WEC 240 bus model. The Polish test cases were developed by Roman Karab and have been distributed with map power for a very long time. We have RTE test cases, which is the French uh, utility, and those were included in a 2016 archive report. And then we have the Pagase um, test cases, which were also developed in collaboration with RTE and others and have been distributed with map power. 
Now, all of these test cases as part of this archive are distributed under Creative Commons BY, so you're free to um, share them, modify them, and redistribute them as you prefer. Now, it's 36 is actually not a huge amount of networks for benchmarking algorithms, so uh, we wanted to develop more test cases that really had different types of properties to make a thorough test of algorithms. So we took these 35 basic cases and we did the following modifications. In one particular class of problems, we have a thing called Active Power Increase Benchmarks, or API, where we linearly scaled up the active power of all the loads in the network, and then we stopped just before the model would become infeasible. In a different type of scenario called the small angle difference benchmarks, what we did is we re reduced the angle difference bounds on all of the lines, and then again we stopped just before the problem became infeasible. Now, you may be thinking, okay, these are two very strange and arbitrary ways of making new data sets, and you're right, um, but fortunately it was shown in this particular report that by generating the benchmarks these ways, um, these test cases exhibited very large, some of them exhibited very large optimality gaps with convex relaxations, which is a hot topic for evaluating the OPF problem right now. So it was decided that these should be included because they give a broader uh, view of the possible inputs and possible challenges of the OPF problem. So in total, we have 108 uh, test cases, and uh, they're broken into these three different categories. Um, I would say at this point that is a reasonable number, but we're hoping to grow it in the future so that we can have even more test cases of the OPF problem. And in the long run, we're hoping to be able to filter out easy test cases so that R&D can focus on open, challenging, hard test cases. Right now, the 108 includes some easy, some hard, and it really depends on you know, what type of properties you're looking to investigate. So that concludes the what are these optimal power flow test cases. Now I'm going to dive into how can you access them and how can you get the most out of these data sets. So if you go to this website, you will see um, it's hosted on github.com, which is typically used for code, but we're using it for data in this case. And if you see this kind of uh, banner that's imaged here, you're in the right place. So if we just zoom in and look at the landing page and what information is here, I'll give you a brief overview of what you're seeing. In this particular section, you're seeing a variety of data files which are providing lightweight documentation. Anything that ends with .md stands for markdown, and you can click on that and view the file in detail. Then you have a list of .m files, which are the map power files of all of the base case networks. And you have a couple of folders, API and SAD, which are for these benchmark groups that were generated in this very specific way and are more synthetic than all of the other test cases in the archive. Probably most users just want to download all of the data that is available. If you click on this green button, it'll open a menu where you can easily download the current version of all of the data. Now let's, as an example, show you what it's like if you click on one of these .md files. So if I click on the readme file, what it's going to do is it's going to bring me to that particular file and it's going to render it in my browser so I can read a textual description of what is in that file. In this case, readme is the base documentation for the repository and it effectively includes all the information that's in this video. You can see here a brief introduction to the data set and then a beginning of a mathematical formulation for what the problem is. If we return back to this uh, kind of landing page for the repository, you can also view the .m files in your browser online without needing to download them. So if you click on one of these files, what you're going to see is a text-based version of the data in your browser, and you can scroll up and down to look at it in detail. I'll just give you a brief overview of the anatomy of one of these files. So at the very top, you have some library information so that if you pass the file around, it can always be traced back to the version which it came from. Then you have a bunch of header information, which includes notes about the network, where it came from, and also who should be credited if you want to reuse the network for any reason. If you scroll down here and uh, look 
in there, you're going to see that there's the matrix data, which is the main body of the data set. And then if you go further down, you'll see that there's a footer data, which includes some notes about any modifications that were made to the network and what models were used for those modifications. And then is in addition to these info lines, you can also see things like warnings when there was some missing data and it got filled in with something else. Um, so there's a lot of detailed information at the end of the file about things that have been fixed over the years or uh, warnings about data that was changed. If we return back to the landing page, another important file which should be uh, very useful to you is this thing called baseline. If you click on baseline, you're going to see some very long tables. And these tables basically give you reference results for all of the test cases in this particular archive. So you can see that you have like case names, um, the value of running a DCOPF, the value of running an ACOPF, and then optimality gaps with some standard relaxations. If you scroll on the table, you can even see some basic run times. Um, so these are baseline results where you can look through this table and then get some insights into you know, what test cases may be useful for the problem that you're interested in studying. Now, another useful piece of information here is at the top of the baseline, it includes uh, the tools that were used for generating this table. And all of the tools up here are 100% free and open source and available on GitHub. So it's incredibly easy to reproduce these results on your computer if you want a baseline for some work that you're doing. Just to demonstrate how easy it is, I'm going to go through the steps in one slide. So the first thing you need to do to replicate the results is to go to this repository website and then download all of the data sets that's done from the green download button, which I've already mentioned. Then you need to go to uh, julialang.org and download the Julia programming language and install it on your computer. Um, at the time of this video, version 0.6 was the current version, so that's the one that these instructions have been tested on. So that first you start up Julia, and all you need to do is enter the following commands. First, you run cd to change the directory of your wherever you started Julia to whatever place you downloaded the pglib opf benchmarks. Then you can do read dir, which will list all the files in the current working directory. And this is just to confirm that you did get into the directory where you put all the test cases. Now you can run package update, package add power models and ipopt, which were the two requirements mentioned in the baseline markdown file. And then you load those packages once you've installed them on your computer by using, using power models and using ipopt. And then last but not least, if you do run ACOPF and you give it a particular um, test case file and then also this IPOP solver, it will generate you, it'll load the file and run an ACOPF optimization and produce a bunch of results output. Now, an interesting thing to note is that if you run the exact same command a second time, it's going to be much, much faster. And this is just a side effect of how Julia works. It compiles everything just in time. And so the second time you run a function, it's much faster than the first time because it's already been compiled. So that's the end of how easy it is to replicate the results. And I hope you find that to be quite easy. Another important feature to notice about this GitHub site is version management. Under the hood of GitHub is a version control system called Git, and we can browse it in this interface to look at old versions or upcoming newer versions of the benchmark library. So if you click on releases, what you're going to see is a place where you can download old versions, the current version and old versions of the code. So right now there's only one release, but in the future there may be many, and you can go back to an old version if necessary. If you click on the branches, right now there's only master because there's only one release, but usually in here you'll also see a staging area for the next year's release of the archive. While we're talking about releases, it's useful to note the version naming conventions that are imposed by the Power Grid lib. So all versions have a format xx.yy, where xx is the year that they were released and yy is the month. So the current OPF benchmarks is 1708 because it was released in August of 2017. Now there are branches called vzz-dev under which development for the next year's release can happen. So if you're interested in any kind of late breaking changes, have a look at a branch and look for a development branch. 
Last but not least, if you have any comments or questions about the archive, problems you've run into, or just questions about why things were done, there's this issue tab in the GitHub interface where you can just uh, open an issue and ask a question or search for previous questions that have been answered um, and just see what's going on with the test cases. So I encourage you to participate in that if you are interested. Now, last but not least, I need to give special thanks to a number of people, Rich Christie, Robin Karab, Jim Price, and RTE, all for graciously providing their data sets under Creative Commons by so that we can all share them and modify them in the future without any concerns around copyright. And I should also thank Dan Malzahan, Lina Roald, and Cedric Jose uh, for giving feedback on this repository while we were curating it and really shaping it into what it is today. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the Optimal PowerFlow Benchmark Repository.